I remember years ago when I read the Blue Zones book for the first time over 10 years ago, and I was blown away. I was like, this is this is so important. <clears throat> this is a big deal. And then I started looking into the research behind it, and it became less of a big deal. And the more I've studied this question over the ensuing years, the less and less of a big deal I think this actually is. Uh, I have a special guest today, Mary Ruddick, who's been to the Blue Zones multiple times and has actually stayed there for significant amounts of time, who's actually eaten the diet there. And we're going to be talking about <clears throat> the very popular Blue Zones diet and many other things about ancient nutrition, indigenous tribes and what they eat and why they eat that, uh, different uh, micronutrients and macronutrients, how these tribes get those in their diet. And so without further ado, let me bring Mary up so she can say hi. Hey, Mary. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful. It's a pleasure to have you on. I've been trying to set this up for months and we finally made it happen. So welcome. Thank you. I'm so sorry. My travel schedule it's a bit difficult with going to all these indigenous regions and Wi-Fi. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. I understand. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Where are you at in the world right now and who are you currently studying? So currently I'm up in uh, the Arctic area of Norway. I've been also in the Arctic area of Sweden and Karuna, well, Sweden and Finland over the last month. But I'm spending time with the Sami. The Sami are a really interesting indigenous group. They're the only indigenous group left in, in all of Europe. And, and they're quite unique in all sorts of ways, uh, quite carnivore, at least traditionally, until their culture was changed. But I, I love going to regions, uh, especially in areas where nature is particularly harsh, because it tells us a lot about what people do to not just survive, but thrive in those areas. And they tend to have an enormous amount of wisdom. They can't be lazy or casual about things and about their health. Uh, most of the things they've built into their rituals are there to uh, provide ample health. Yeah. And I've, <clears throat> I've read a little bit about the Sami people and it looks like before about 1500, uh, they were almost exclusively uh, uh, mammal carnivores, mammalian carnivores. And then I think with the Vikings coming in, they got pushed a little further north and they, they wound up now that they, they eat a combination of fish and meat. And they've actually uh, tamed some reindeer herds, or at least at some time. And so they actually, part, at least partially domesticated. Partly. Yeah, yeah partly. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, there's, there's four different types of Sammy. So one type of Sami, one, one subset, uh, was primarily fisher. Uh, so they would do fishing and whale and, and that kind of thing, mostly fish though. And then you have reindeer herders. So there's different subsets, but the uh, ones that do the fishing, they will also eat reindeer too. Uh, but it, it really depends on where they are. And especially up in the Arctic, I saw this in Greenland when I was at the Inuits too. Even if you just go 20 miles, that can completely change the community's diet by what's there. So, so there's a lot, there's a bit of range, but it is quite, quite carnivore traditionally. And now here's the, here's the question. If you don't mind, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Deb says question about pregnancy and carnivore. Is it safe for the baby? Now you've, you've uh, visited with multiple indigenous tribes all around the world. And so the first food that any baby, human baby should ingest is mother's breast milk that is the perfect food for baby humans uh, when they start to cut a few teeth and when when the mother starts to uh, introduce solid food in every indigenous culture you've been in around the world what what's the first food the first solid food that's introduced how is it introduced and how do the babies seem to to do health wise that is a great question well, I think anytime we're asking about if something is uh, healthy or safe for children, for pregnancy, we can always look at history because nothing teaches us better than history. And right. when you go to these indigenous regions, these people have been eating these diets for, um, 
I don't want to put a perfect number on it, but hundreds, if not thousands of years. And yet they don't have the birth issues that we have. I haven't been to a single one that's had uh, infertility or death in childbirth or wasting or any of the conditions that we have. No, and so, uh, I think, no childhood type two diabetes, no childhood fatty <laughs> liver, no, none of that. No, no, none of that. None of that. And in fact, that I think was the thing that blew me away the most when I first started going to these regions, because I had expected due to kind of all the publicity of infant mortality, that that was what I would see, but I, I haven't seen it unless modern foods have been brought in. So I don't see how, how carnivore could possibly be unhealthy for a child if generations have, have thrived on it far better than us. That said, you asked about first foods. It is different uh, with each place that I go to, but it is very typically, if it's a dairy consuming culture, they'll usually give the child butter. Uh, it puts on weight and helps them grow strong. Uh, some cultures, the mother will masticate meat or they'll do very soft meat. There's many cultures like in the Arctic where a lot of it is raw, honestly. You have uh, blood and raw meats and things like that. It's almost silly to cook things up here. It's a bit of a waste. So uh, a very large portion of the diet is, is raw meat. Because firewood is very, very rare when you get to the very northernmost latitudes because trees yeah. can't really grow up there. And then also they're going to be under feet of snow sometimes. And so very often they'll eat the food raw. Now, you said that the mothers uh, in some cultures will masticate meat for my mm -hmm. for my uh, uh, followers who don't read as much as, as Mary and I do. That means chew the food. And so there's actually a theory in anthropology that that's where the a ki kissing came from was that the mother would masticate or chew the food for the baby who didn't have a full set of teeth yet and then kiss the food into the mouth. And that's not been proven, but there's multiple anthropologists who are very, they lean heavily towards that theory that that's where the tradition of kissing came from. And uh, so first foods that you've seen in your travels all around with different indigenous species, raw meat, mm -hmm. um, uh, chewed up meat, uh, dairy, if it's a dairy culture, and I, mm -hmm. I definitely got questions about dairy because uh, sure. my opinions about dairy as, as a proper food for humans differs a little bit uh, mm -hmm. with from uh, other people in the carnivore and keto communities. Um, and so in these children whose first food, first solid food is, is meat or a, some milk, butter, you just don't see childhood obesity, you know, even though even though we, we've been told multiple times recently by the mainstream media that eating meat increases your risk of diabetes, you don't see that type 2 diabetes, fatty liver obesity in these indigenous cultures whose very first food is meat. No, in fact, I was discussing this with one of my Sami friends in, in Sweden, and he was discussing how horrible it's been to watch from his parents' generation to his, to his children's because they had never seen diabetes. And they actually have several theories about the epigenetics of the Sami culture, the Sami people, that they may be more insulin sensitive because yeah. uh, right, they were always functioning out of a ketogenic state. And when the settlers came in, they really forced their culture upon them in, in an unusually brutal way. I mean, usually it's brutal, but it was pretty exceptional and it was recent. Uh, so it's really quite recent in the generations. It's really the last generation and the one before that. And that's when grains were brought in and some of the carbohydrates, they don't tolerate them as well. So their, their insulin really reacts uh, much more so than yeah. ours even. And same with their blood sugar as well. And we see not in, on the traditional diet. <laughs> yeah. And we see this in multiple different cultures. You, you see this in the Native American tribes when they're introduced to a, a Western modern diet, the they're, I mean, it's almost a 50, 50 chance they'll develop type two diabetes very early in life. It's their, their, their DNA just is not compatible with this. You see this in, in many um, African cultures, they just cannot tolerate the grains and the beans mm -hmm. and they develop type two diabetes very quickly. Now, let, before we go further, let's just talk about this blue zones, the book I was just mm -hmm. saying before you came on, I, I read this when it first came out and I was a young family physician and I was like, holy shit, this is a big deal. This is, this is going to change everything because I just read the book. Right. But then when I started actually looking into the research, the supporting research that Butner uses, but then also just, when I really started to dig into anthropology, paleoanthropology, archaeology, I was like, I don't think any of this is correct. Give us 
your kind of global opinion about uh, not not a, a, any any negative way to Buchner, but but just the the theory and the it's becoming very popular again, as you know. Uh, there yes. was a recent documentary on Netflix. What what is the truth about the Blue Zones diets? And first of all, how many of, of the Blue Zones have you been to? How many mm-hmm. times have you been there? How long have you stayed? And then what's your kind of your takeaway about the 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 popular myth of the Blue Zones? And what's the actual truth about the Blue Zones? So I've been to every single one of the Blue Zones, most several times, and all for long periods, none for two days. <laughs> right? Perfect. Uh, Perfect. In fact, I, so you actually yes. know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I do. And I, I lived in Greece for the last five years. That was one of my homes. The other is in South Africa. And so I spent a good amount of time in Ikaria and went in different seasons as well, which is one of the one of the blue zones. Uh, luckily, because my job I can do remote and I would often do every other week when I had my private practice open, uh, I would go and stay places for long periods of time and work within the cities and then go out into the regions every other week. So I would typically stay for long periods of time. And I, I genuinely, I was surprised. I, I really, from the onset of, uh, my background and seeing my family and uh, and also seeing other people heal from my same condition that I had when I was when I was sick with different diets. I've always felt and and really known from history that people can be healthy on different diets. Doesn't mean that every diet is appropriate right now for you, but there, there's obvious clear history that we can eat different diets and be in pretty perfect health, much yes. more so than we are today. And so I expected to see a large amount of uh, grains, carbohydrates, these kind of things being eaten. I was surprised by how how little, especially in Greece, I would say, because the Greeks really do eat a varied diet. And also in Okinawa, because so much has been written. Of course, I think one of the issues with, with Butner and, and with so many people that report on the Blue Zones, they don't have a health background. So they don't always have the right eyes to look with. I think it's really, at least it started out, I think, very innocently. Yeah. Uh, just like, oh, this is great. Uh, but if, I, if I'm if i perfectly honest, the Blue Zones simply don't exist. They just simply don't exist. <laughs> it's uh, uh, There are people that live far longer, far healthier in many, many regions of the world, hundreds of regions of the world. Uh, and in these zones, are people really good? Yes. But the outlines that they've they've put down are not accurate. In many of the places they smoke, in many of the places they're not active, uh, in many of the places they really don't eat plant matter or very little, or it's seasonal, like Ikaria is very seasonal and much less than one would expect, even knowing the Greek diet. And so and so really what I've seen in these zones is that there has been extremely uh, innocently, but false reporting about what the people eat due to a lack of language. Uh, I see it in Greece, I see it, uh, you know, the Okinawans, they're really not Japanese. They're Okinawan first. It's a different kingdom, different language, different culture. Only recently have they been adopted into Japan. So the Okinawans consider themselves Okinawan first and Japanese second. So you can't think like rice. You can't think Mm -hmm. like the Japanese diet. It is quite different. And having lived on many, many different tropical islands, typically the staple is pork and fish. And it it was there too. So that that wasn't too surprising. But it was surprising at the extreme level of animal product I saw, including drinking a lot of snake liquor, (laughs) where they have actual snakes in the liquor. That was surprising. (laughs) So uh, I I would try a little shot of that. I, I did. I did. It was fun. Yeah, it was harsh. Yeah. Oh, I bet. I bet. Yeah. Snake venom liquor. Nice. Yes. Yeah. I'll have to put that on yeah. my bucket list for sure. Mm-hmm. So uh, <laughs> you talked about fruit a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. I've been surprised because, you know, I'm a, I'm a country boy from Tennessee. So mm-hmm. it, it, I didn't go to any jungle regions for until much later in my life. So I just assumed that in the jungle, there's always fruit ripe year round and that, you know, people eat fruit all the time year round. And uh, there's a, a segment of the carnivore community now that includes a large daily portion of ripe fruit in their diet now. And I, I, the more I looked at, again, the anthropology of this, the more I realized that, uh, you know, first of all, humans have been hybrid breeding and crossbreeding and selectively breeding fruit even in the deepest, darkest jungle for thousands of years. And so you, 
you literally can't find a fruit tree that hasn't been messed with by humans for hundreds, if not thousands of years, even in the deepest parts of the jungle. But now you've actually been there multiple times. Tell us about fruit in the jungle. Is it, is it available year round? And do people eat fruit every day? I honestly never see fruit when I'm in the jungle. I never see it. The same with most of Africa and the places that I think from our childhood books and movies, we assume there's a ton of fruit. There's just not. Uh, it's very seasonal. It's very short lived. Often the animals eat it first. Uh, it's not It's not the sought after food from any of the groups that I go for. They're not going out searching for fruit or really excited to dig for roots. They're actually going for animal. Uh, whatever animal is in that area is their favorite. Sometimes they'll go really far. Like in uh, in the Amazon, one of my favorite places to go, they love tapir. And you often have to hunt for three days at night to get a tapir. But they'll go and they'll go with gusto. They're excited. So, so they're not doing that for bananas. <laughs> Right, right. I, I <laughs> yeah. think that that was the truth, but I, I love confirming that with somebody who's actually been there multiple times. Yes. Um, now, there's a, a, a lot of people in the carnivore community that say you need to eat only beef, never eat pork. Um, and I've, I've been watching a few of your interviews, and, and I, I think you and I tend to probably agree on this. I think beef is great, and I think for many people it needs to be the majority of their diet, but uh, pork is not without its benefits. And so you, you've you already said that pork is a huge part of, of the diet in multiple blue zones. Yeah. Do you have a problem with pork? Uh, do you have any reservations about pork or do you think that should be part of everybody's proper human diet? I'll be honest, I, I think we can be healthy with or without it, but it is one of my favorites because growing up today, most of us are depleting enormous amounts of B1, of yes. thiamine from our diet all of our childhood and adulthood. And we don't have many foods with a lot of thiamine in it. Even if you ate two cups of pork a day, which is one of the highest foods with thiamine, it's hard to get your RDA and actually absorb that. A lot of that comes down to the microbiome too. It's not just what we're eating. Of course, we have a lot of foods from white rice to cassava, traditional foods, but still uh, we eat them in larger quantities now and without the traditional context of the rest of the meal. So we get a lot of thiamine blocking uh, protein in layman speak. <laughs> so, so basically we're not absorbing the thiamine. But further from that, a lot of people have overgrowth in their microbiome of very specific microbes. You can have C. diff, which will put many people in a hospital, but many people will be going along with chronic illness, but not it's not dire. It's very uncomfortable for the person. And C. diff will block thiamine from being absorbed. So you could be eating all that you need and not getting it. And pork is a perfect source of that. It's there's a reason why it was so praised by Islanders. It has an enormous amount of very important amino acids and B vitamins, which really are quite required for keeping cytokines down, for getting mitochondria going, for kind of all the things that we're struggling with today, including glucose, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so I'm a big fan, I'm a big fan of pork. And I do, if you don't mind, I wanna circle back to the fruit just quickly. Oh, yes, I think, please. Yeah, I think it's so important to say, I, I'm also seeing this trend of eating enormous amounts of fruit. And while many people may get away, away with it, maybe, maybe even feel great on it, it's not historical. And to me as a practitioner, it's a bit worrisome because when we consume fruit year round in large amounts of it, the fructose gets processed through the liver. Our liver is working to the tilt already with all of our cortisol and hormones and exogenous hormones. We have all of the industrial chemicals that the liver has to process, right? All the fat soluble chemicals go through the liver to process. So if the liver is constantly busy with fructose, it can lead to problems backing up in the body. So I, I can see where some people may feel really great on it, but I, I, I can't imagine getting someone better eating a lot of fruit. Yeah, <laughs> I think no, that would I be a tall order. Yes. And, then, and so when we talk about these indigenous cultures and when we talk about uh, the archaeological research on diets, a lot of uh, nutrition gurus on the internet will say we're committing a, a logical fallacy, the appeal to nature. And I don't agree with that. I think that, first of all, they want to talk about, oh, there's no research on that. Well, in my opinion, evolution is the largest 
uh, research study ever conducted by nature, not even by, you know, sci uh, human scientists who can have preconceived notions and, 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 and make uh, logical fallacies. That is the largest ongoing trial and error experiment ever conducted. And so to, to discount the anthropology and archaeology, and so it doesn't matter what we ate in the past, we've got this modern nutrition research, I think is foolish on its face. And I think uh, you can see that with, with the amount of grains, wheat, rice, oats, and corn, soybean that, that people eat in modern society versus what the hunter-gatherer societies you visited eat, and then what the, what the, the stable isotope analysis shows us in past cultures. It's, it's like foolishness. Let's, let's talk about grains. Uh, in, in your visits with the, all the hunter-gatherer societies, uh, how much grain consumption do you see? What, is it like 50% of their diet, 70% no, no. of their diet? How, how much how, are they eating grains? If they eat grains, how are they processing the grains? And what's the total consumption? A great question. Hunter gathers zero grain. Uh, by definition, they're just hunting and then they gather if they feel like it. It's mostly hunting. And then with agrarian societies, uh, or uh, they'll typically have a lot of cattle or reindeer, like with the Sami here. And for them, they may have grain or not have grain, and it tends to be black or white. So many of them don't, like the Maasai or the Sami that I'm with now. Some do, like the Datoga, uh, the Iraq in Africa, they do some grain. It would be things like sorghum and millet, the ancestral grains, and they're not a bulk of the diet. They're a, a small portion that's seasonal. It's not year round, and it's really to soak up fat. So that's one of the biggest things the Blue Zone has really missed is the fat that's being used. It's very often lard, lard. it's always animal fat. And, and that would be the case for that as well. But it, it's not their bulk food. It's kind of just like an extra that they have. And so in all the, yeah. the video on the Netflix documentary, The Blue Zones, yeah. when, when they have all this video of these people eating this plant-based diet, you're telling me that all that stuff was cooked in lard. Yeah, it's cooked in lard. So Costa Rica was surprising for me because I, I've spent a lot of time in the Latin cultures before I went to Costa Rica. And I, I did expect it to be a lot of corn and bean and that sort of thing. And I had read the archaeological books as well. And uh, it, it was so much more lard than I expected. It was so much more and milk and dairy. And that was really what they, they prized. That was what they worked towards every day to get. That's what they enjoyed. It's typically out of enjoyment. You know, we often put our current mentality and our current society on the past and think that it was like that. Uh, but we have living examples of the past right now. I, I go and stay with them all the time. And uh, and so when people try to discard archaeology or anthropology, it's going on right now. We can go see it. And, and what tradition really is, which is what a diet is, tradition is just right. following something that worked generation after generation after generation. Yeah. It works. And that's why it's tradition, right? Um, a lot of that we're finding now with the with the male female hormones as to why certain uh, genders did certain roles because it affects the hormones differently. It doesn't mean we have to go and do what we did, but it it is something to be mindful of. So, so when I go to these cultures, there's just an enormous amount of fats and an enormous amount of dairy, uh, and typically the the vegetables that they're filming are not traditional. To that region. So when they're filming in Greece or Sardinia, they'll often have a lot of tomatoes and potatoes. Right. But those have only been in the region for 50 years at most. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yes. Like they literally never ate that before 50 or 100 no. years ago. They, that was never in their diet. Yes, exactly. Never. Yeah. And so, uh, so many people, uh, uh, my wife, uh, Nisha, is, is, has Puerto Rican heritage. And so many of her family members, they think that rice and beans, that's part of our culture. That's our heritage. And what so many people don't realize is that just because your mom and your grandmother fixed that, that's, that, that's not your heritage, not your culture. Because when you follow literally any ethnic DNA line back far enough, they were, they were uh, predominantly carnivore. Yes, and, yes. and and they didn't need any, gra any grains, any beans whatsoever. And so only for the last few generations have we eaten that. But you, as you know, when you do something, when you see your mom doing something and your grandmother, maybe your great grandmother, 
And you can, you're like, well, that's my heritage. That's my culture. That's what we do. That's what we've done forever. Yes. But in, many, in the majority of cases, that's absolutely untrue. You've only been doing that for a few generations and, the, and your DNA is probably not okay with that. Yes. In fact, uh, you see that a lot in Africa. So I've spent many years in Africa. And one of my friends lives in a village in Zambia. And I was having her send me a lot of different things from the shamans there before going. And she was telling me that their diet was, uh, I mean, their diet, you, you would be very worried about these people if you were <laughs> their diet. And they swear up and down that that is their traditional diet. But what it was, and this this honestly happens a lot, it's happening here, is that uh, a sect of, of a church came, more of like a cultish kind of sect of a church came yeah. to that region. They were hunter-gatherers only 100 years ago. But they got so punished for doing their traditional diet and their traditional religion. And I, I mean, we're talking like burning people alive, like really yeah. punished uh, yeah. to where people are will just submit and say, what do you, what do you want? <laughs> and so they've been eating beans and corn and they think they've had corn forever. Yeah, right? no, and I, I've, I've seen this multiple times in archaeology. Some of the larger religions that uh, love to go and, you know, save these indigenous cultures, yeah. Uh, where they're, the cruelty is astounding. It's astounding uh, how these these religions showed their love for the for the natives who they were trying to to save their soul. And it, it's it's sad, really sad, when you read about this and how they were treated and mistreated. But after so many generations of that, you forget where you came from. You forget what your actual true culture was, what your true heritage was. Um, now the the grains when when they do eat grains. Yeah. I've actually talked about Bill, Bill Schindler about this. I love him. Time. Yeah, he's a good friend yeah, he's of mine. Amazing. He's, <laughs> he's amazing. I've got a uh, one interview of him on my channel here, and, and we have plans for many more. Uh, he's actually going to come to the farm. I, I raise sheep here on my farm in Tennessee, and we're going to actually process mm -hmm. a sheep using the ancient stone, stone tools and eat it wow. the ancient way uh, when I get my setup completed here. But yeah, I love Schindler. But we talked about corn for the Aztec and the Maya and then the Olmec even before that and how they never first of all corn originally was about this long it's not a big deal but through generations of crossbreeding they actually made a thing out of it that you could eat but they never just ate corn on the cob mm -mm. no so how, well, no and that's the whole process right yeah, so corn, when, when it goes through the five-step process, like it does still, honestly, in many parts of Mexico, I, I spent four months with the Mayans and the Toltecs this year in the, in, the, in the forest, basically in the jungle, and the corn was absolutely being processed the correct way and cooked in lard. When you have it processed the proper way, the ancestral way, plus your microbiome is in perfect health, there's no problem. Yeah. We have very damaged microbiomes. We have been using antibiotics. We have had different birth processes. We have lighting that affects our uh, lighting affects our microbiome as much as diet. So at least in the studies I've seen. So there's so many factors that put us at a put us on a back heel. And the uh and then on top of it, we're eating these traditional foods, like you could say white rice in some areas or or corn, but we're not processing them. In the ancestral ways and so we're bringing them in with all of the plant toxins the oxalates the lectins which are very problematic for the immune system and honestly not hard to lower and of course then the starch which starch traditionally was not a problem but with an imbalanced microbiome absolutely is and so uh and so we're just eating popcorn or corn on the cob and really it has to go through a five-step process for it to be considered a neutral food for our body yeah and if you don't go through the proper process of processing corn, then you can wind up with a severe vitamin B3 uh, yes. deficiency that can lead to a disease called pellagra. And mm -hmm. actually, my my grandfather's mother, my great grandmother died uh, in mm -hmm. Virginia uh, from pellagra. And that was mm -hmm. when she died. It was still considered they didn't know what caused it. They're like, maybe it's an yes. infection. We don't know. And they called it the filth disease because yeah. it, typically people who suffered from pellagra were poor. And mm -hmm. so they wound up eating a corn diet, a cornbread diet. That's just what they ate. And so they would grind it up and cook it. And they didn't yes. know that you had to process it. And so I actually have a direct ancestor who died from B3 deficiency. Yeah. Because of the yeah, there was, 
Oh, well, first, I just want to say I'm really sorry about that, and that they weren't they weren't alone. There was an epidemic; hundreds of thousands of people died in America uh, from that. And I I really think, and I'm not alone in this. We have widespread uh, widespread deficiencies, uh, high caloric malnutrition essentially in our country. So we're seeing a lot of that, and uh, and we get it from eating foods the wrong way. So like you were saying, if you eat corn that hasn't gone through the five-step step process and nixtamalization, then you get pellagra. But there are many forms, there's levels of these yeah. conditions. And yeah. what happens to the patient is they're often told, oh, it's in your head, just be better. You know, you have a character flaw. <laughs> And it, it's not, it's really very physical and it's something you can die from. Same with B1 as well. What I've seen in the indigenous populations, and I, I really think this is part of why the Sami are struggling right now with their insulin and blood sugar levels. If they don't eat their traditional diet, many are going back to it for this reason, uh, who, who have strayed as some haven't. But I, I really think this is part of the problem. When a food is brought from say Mexico, like corn, and then it's brought to Africa, the, the methods aren't brought with it. And so the corn isn't eaten correctly. Same when corn came from South America to North America. That's why we had the big ep epidemic with so many hundreds of thousands of people dying just in 1900. It wasn't long ago. So, uh, so yes, it's, it's definitely still going on today. Yeah, absolutely. And so I grew up my entire life uh, mm -hmm. thinking that I had a mental health uh, problem in my family because before she died, she was institutionalized <laughs> multiple times. Uh, in, a, in an insane asylum. That's what they call them back then because she was acting crazy. And so I grew up the first half of my life thinking, oh gosh. And I remember when I was younger, I acted out in school. I had ADHD. They didn't know what that mm -hmm. was. But my, yeah. my grandmother, my, my grandfather's wife, uh, was very worried about me and took me to a psychiatrist very early because there was this mental health history in the family. Oh, it turns yeah. out, she was perfectly mentally healthy. She just had pellagra, and that's one of the symptoms is you it, it messes with your brain. And so I think there's so many people who have this mental health history in their family, a great grandmother, a great grandfather, and it their brain was fine. They were just eating the wrong foods, not properly processing the foods. And now you're carrying this burden of mental health family history, and you don't have that at all. They just were malnourished misnourished uh, and, and now you've got this thing that you think you have and you don't even have that. Yes, yes. When I, I used to be the director of a mental health clinic in Oregon and I can't tell you the amount of cases of niacin deficiency that were misdiagnosed as mental illness. Often schizophrenia, the other one that's the most common misdiagnosis is eating disorders. Uh, and, and addiction, actually. I mean, uh, Bill, who created Alcoholics Anonymous, knew about that. It was part of his program. It unfortunately fell by the wayside. But niacin is amazing for addictions. Of course, not in the context of eating, you know, the modern junk diet. But, but you, yes, but, but you see it anytime you see people. Well, okay, the places I go, there, there is no mental illness. Uh, everyone's producing all their feel-good chemicals, right? Plus they have all the wonderful amino acids and fats for their nervous system, specifically. So yesterday when I was coming home from my Sammy visit and coming home <laughs> to my Airbnb, uh, <laughs> they were talking about some of their traditional foods and one of them mentioned making brain cookies. And I was really interested in that because uh, the Sammy are known for making blood pancakes. There's no grain in that, by the way, it's, it's <laughs> blood and, and fat. But you fry it and it's quite delicious and quite good for you. And uh, they were surprised that I was interested in the brain cookie. They were like, oh, people don't really like, it's rare for people to make that now. And we now you're not saying brain it. cookie. You're yeah, saying I am. Bra brain cookie. Yeah. Yes, brain, brain, brain cookie, like, not, not, not brain cookie. Yes, mm -mm. yes. Yes, yes. And I was so interested because brain is uh, the most favorite food of almost everywhere I go. And when I ask people what their favorite food is, that's that's the first answer. And they have it in all these ways that are really delicious. It can taste like a custard. They share it. But but I was most interested because when I go back home to the States now, it seems like everyone is on mental health medication and everyone is not happy. Right. There's no satisfaction. There's no natural just joy and satisfaction. There's a lot of despair or stress and it doesn't exist. In the places where I go. And what brain is very rich in, it's rich in many things, but one thing is, is phosphatidylserine. 
which is really great for the cell membrane, which is so rarely discussed, but so important for human health and for regulating cortisol levels as well and helping sleep, which uh, anyone who has kids knows that if you don't sleep well, you're kind of a pain to be around, right? So, so anyway, I was very interested in it, but even they were shy to talk about it because the normal reaction from people is, is horror if they bring up something like that. Yeah. Now, yeah. organ meat, we, we've yeah. talked about that. Let's go into more detail because in modern society, everybody thinks that, that organ meat's gross. Uh, the kind of the ancient Anglo-Saxon term for for it is awful, which kind of rhymes with awful. And so people are like, yeah, organs are awful. I don't want to eat organs. What has been your experience when you go to the hunter-gatherer societies? Uh, how often are organs consumed? How much? How many organs? Which organs? And should we be in any way concerned about eating organs a, as a modern culture? Or should we all just shut up and grow up and eat our liver? <laughs> well, I've seen people heal without them and with them. So going back to the beef only or or not, I've seen people heal with the different varieties of carnivore. But I, I know from the traditional Russian way of, of uh, teaching it in a practitioner patient stance, they were not rigid about that at all. So, so that was different. But the amount of organ meat is directly related to how much animal uh, the culture consumes. So if I'm with, say, the Maasai, and they're drinking blood and milk for three days, there's no organ meats for those three days. When they slaughter an animal, then they share the organ meats amongst them. Uh, and that's typically the pattern that I see. So it's not the large, like a whole plate of organ meat that's being eaten, it's being shared, uh, but it is frequent and multiple times a week. And it is all of them from the glands as well, like the thymus, uh, the eye tissue. Most of the cultures I go to have a mythology about one or two of them where they either don't or they do eat it. So for instance, with the Sami here, they don't eat the tip of the tongue. And that, that's pretty common across cultures. Uh, uh, there's a belief about that, a mythological belief. Some some places won't eat the eye and other places right. really prize it. But in general, the organs are, are always consumed as well as the other parts that we rarely talk about, like uh, the, the gelatinous tissue around the bone is yes. very prized, right? And it's very good for our health. The bone marrow as well, the yes. skin. Um, so I was, I was dog sledding. All, I, drove my own dog sled for the first time. It was very nice. exciting. I think so. I was very excited about it. It was, it was one of my best days of my life. But the, the dogs were fed today chicken skin, which was brought up. Usually it would be another animal of skin, but the chicken is like a special treat. And the snow was very, very thick today. We've had a lot of powder come. And so the dogs, it's hard for them to do the running. And so they gave them the chicken skin as a treat. But the cultures eat everything. It's, it's not just the liver. It's not just the kidney. It is all of it, lungs, uh, heart, all of it. So what I'm seeing in the States with the, the kind of new focus on organ meat is great. So I love I love seeing it because it's nutrient dense, right? And we've had a nutrient deficient diet, but it's not very ancestral, I would say. Uh, ancestrally, you would be boiling a head to have soup. <laughs> you would be sucking the bone marrow. You would right. be eating the organ meats at uh, two to three times a week, but not, not in these massive quantities. Now I right. can see where that's beneficial. Um, uh, and in some places I do see more like in, in the mountains of Peru where there's very low oxygen, anywhere I've been with low oxygen, you tend to see a lot more organ meat consumed, specifically heart, which tends to increase the oxygen of the blood. So, so you tend to see the relation there. Um, but, but yeah, so it does vary, but that would be the general. I would say across the now, if, if somebody in modern society, if they hear me and you talking about this and they're like, yeah, yeah, I hear you, but I ain't going to do that. What do you think about the desiccated organ supplement capsules? Do you think yeah. that they're better than nothing or do you think yeah. that they're a waste of money? Uh, I think if no, if somebody's never going to eat organs, then I'm like, yeah, take an organ supplement. It's better than nothing. What, what's your opinion mm -hmm. on that? I do think it's better than nothing. I used to feel like they didn't work, but now the brands are so much better. Um, so now I really do see them work and I do think it's better than nothing. But I, I think it's important in America in particular, more so than any other country I go to, we are very phobic of real food. Uh, if I'm in Europe, I, like I was going out to, to dinner with a person from France in, when I was in Japan. And 
we ate raw horse, tartar, and all these things that are just on the normal menu in Japan. Fallopian tubes. Have you ever heard of an American eating a fallopian tube? It no, had eggs on I, it. Misha and I, there's a, a big Asian yeah. market in Nashville. And when we go to Nashville, we love to go to the Hispanic market and the Asian market because the Asian yes. market, you never know what part of an animal That's will true. be in a styrofoam <laughs> container. I'm like, what the hell? What is that? Yes. yes. Somebody's yes. going to that and they they and so yeah. fallopian tubes what else have you yeah. seen that you're like wow i've never seen that before oh my gosh literally all of it like anything that you think you would never eat it's eaten and it's prized and it's not out of lack we tend to think in america that these things are eaten out of scarcity it exactly. is exactly awesome. yes please go into that because most people think well yeah if you're starving to death you'll eat any damn thing you know you'll be yeah. eating pig buttholes if you're starving but these people aren't eating this because they're starving they're they're actually no. choosing that Yes. Yeah. They're not, I haven't been anywhere where people have been hungry or in need of food. They don't hoard food like we do. We hoard food and we have this real lack culture, like stack it high and price it low. Everywhere I go, food is so abundant. It's just joyful. If they're going out for a hunt, it's it's fun. And if they're cooking, it's fun. They're they're not in dire need. They're not starving. They're not sick. They're not, uh, you know, drudgery to go get food. Uh, they're not going a far way. When I give examples like the tapir, where they'll go three days, that's because they just want tapir. There's tons of food to eat around. So, so it's not out of a, a lack. And I think a lot of people assume that if you're eating stingray or you're eating fallopian tube, it's because there's nothing else to eat and you're going to die. It's quite the opposite. These people are healthier and more nourished than any of us have ever been. I love it. And now I'm, I'm sure that eating sting, stingray is probably a great source of iodine. And I consider mm -hmm. iodine to be one of the most important micronutrients. And I think that the majority of people in modern society are at least somewhat deficient in iodine. A lot of people are afraid of iodine uh, because when we were growing up, there used to be this stuff called uh, methylate or mercurochrome, and it had the skull and crossbones on it. And your grandmother would put that on your skin, but you could never touch the bottle because if you drank it, it would kill you. Uh, yes. And so a lot of people have this irrational fear of iodine. And I'm like, I've got multiple videos on my YouTube channel about it's absolutely a necessity and you're probably not getting enough iodine. And I wanted to ask you, uh, I know you have, uh, you believe that about iodine as well. It's super important. Uh, tell us what you think about iodine and, and modern society, how much we're getting. Uh, we're, we're simply horrifically deficient. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of heavy metal issues, right? People are often afraid of fish and, and items that have heavy metals, but there are things that block those as well and things that facilitate their storage in the body. So for instance, oxalates, uh, which are found in like spinach and, and, and nuts and things like that, that really facilitates the binding of heavy metals in the body, whereas iodine does the opposite. So you'll notice that the foods that tend to have uh, heavy metals have iodine. It's a protective method. Uh, nature is really quite perfect <laughs> with the way it produces I agree. food. I agree. Yes, yes. And we really need a lot of iodine. You can get iodine as well from grass-fed animals like lamb and cattle. Uh, at least it, it would depend on the region, but in many That's regions, right. like when I was living in Oregon, it was very high in the in the grass. And so you would have it Absolutely. in the animal product as well. Uh, right. But again, that's quite regional. But no, iodine is, is really quite essential. And I I mean, I don't know what the stats are, but if I had to guess, three out of five, if not four out of five uh, women have thyroid issues. I mean, it's yep. so high. Yeah. It's so high. And uh, and of course, iodine is just one of the, the many factors. There's also selenium and the others. But we think of iodine with the thyroid, but it belongs in every cell of the body. Absolutely. It's essential. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I, think a, we're very... I have a video about that. Every single human cell that we've ever studied has something called a sodium iodide symport on it yes. that actively pulls iodine into that cell. So it's not iodine is not just about your thyroid. It's about the health of every single cell in your body without exception. There's never been a cell line found in human beings that did not have a, a symporter that pulled iodine in, inside the cell. And so I think so many people get so focused on the thyroid, uh, which definitely concentrates iodine and needs a, a rich source of iodine, but every cell needs iodine. Now, in your travels, when you go to a country, uh, a, a population who's predominantly a herding culture, mm -hmm. where do they get their iodine if they don't live near, you know, near a, an ocean shore? Because when you get to the larger interiors of continents, 
there's not much iodine in the soil. And so how do they prioritize that? Where do they get their iodine? That's a really good question. I know from many of the places that I've gone that are herding or carnivore uh, throughout Africa, they have plenty of iodine from, uh, from the soil and from the grass that the animals are eating. But you know, when I've been in places like the Mongolia with the Kazakh eagle hunters, I haven't looked into that and they're in perfect health and their hair and nails are something we would pay a lot of money for, right? And iodine right. affects that too. So so I will look into that and I'll get back to you because oh, I, I can good. definitely get you answers on that. Yes. Because I guarantee you they have a source of iodine, but I would love yeah. to know what it is. Because, uh, you know, in, in the central part of the North American continent, it used to be known as the Gorder Belt around the Great Lakes and in the, in the central part of the United States. Because they're so far from the ocean, there's just not a good source of iodine. And if iodine's not in the soil, then it's not going to be in the plants and it's not going to be in the animals that eat the plants. And so that's where iodine salt came from because the, the the Army Department of War couldn't find enough boys to draft for World War I because they all had a gorder. And so they, they talked to the salt companies and they wound up putting just enough iodine to get rid of a gorder. In no way is the iodine and iodine salt enough iodine? Absolutely not for optimal function, but it will get rid of your gorder. Yeah, of a, a very severe condition. But I will say the places that I've gone, and I can't say this is uh, across the board, there's places I haven't been. So I, I can't say if this is a, a broad statement for all the central cultures, but of the ones that I've been to in the regions very, very far from an ocean, they are all carnivore. And when you're carnivore and specifically ketogenic, so these are ketogenic carnivore cultures, yep. uh, the fat level is high even for me and I, I eat way more fat than most people. So uh, uh, when you're in that state, your vasopressin hormone is very, very balanced. And vasopressin is involved for our listeners in the uptake of things like the sodium and the other minerals. And it really controls that. So now we have pretty chronic uh, uh hydration issues, really over hydration in many yep. areas, and then under hydration within the cell. And so really from over drinking and other things and the stress and the sleep uh, really affects the vasopressin. And so when the vasopressin is deregulated, very much like insulin, the, uh, the minerals aren't taken up. Now, why I bring this up is because these cultures are going to have perfect vasopressin. And so they're not going to require as much iodine, sodium, and other things. Now they do always have sodium. They always have salt, and they prize salt, but they don't. Uh, they don't require things. They they typically don't really drink. I, I don't see cultures drinking water. None of them. Oh come us. on now, Mary. That's ridiculous. <laughs> You're telling me that these these super healthy hunter gatherers they don't drink their body weight in ounces of water a day. No, not even a full cup of water a day. It's so little. And this is in the heat, the, the hottest season with them hiking for 12 hours a day uh, and not sweating. They're not thirsty because they're not dehydrated. We, we have this idea that we need all this water and we, we've been sold that through the hydration yep. companies. Yep. But it's caused a health epidemic, to be perfectly I honest. Totally agree. Totally yes. agree. Yeah, yeah. And I tell people all the time, they're like, well, I'm drinking. I'm like, stop that. Why are you doing yes. that? That's actually hard on your kidneys messes yeah. with your electrolytes and your minerals who yeah. told you and, and I, I, all of them are like no i actually bought this special mug that holds a gallon of water and i try to drink that every day and that's so often i'm like yes yeah, stop that immediately that's <laughs> dumb that literally is no physiological reason to do that so you don't see the Maasai or the sammy drinking a, a gallon of water a day and, no and one no no yeah water really isn't consumed uh, you might have broth in some of the colder countries, but not not like mug after mug after mug. And no one is really thirsty. That I that dry mouth, you know, uh, that doesn't occur. What have you have you interviewed Tim Noakes? I've talked to him multiple times. I haven't had him on the channel yet, but we're we're planning that for the near future. Uh, I love uh, talk that to him about uh, me too. Talk to him about water because he has over 700 studies and, and a lot of them on vasopressin and hydration. Uh, and he rarely talks about that subject because most people want to talk about carbs with him. Right. But the the hydration is really fascinating. And what he found really blew my socks off. And, the, and that is that uh, people are getting the 
encephalitis, right? A swollen brain from drinking too much water. And he was studying this in athletes. So he was having athletes that weren't dying. And then they started consuming all the water when the recommendations changed. And that's when they started seeing a lot of the water logging, which is a, a term for someone who dies from overhydration. <laughs> and it, it does happen more often than we would like to think. Absolutely kill you. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then vasopressin too. I mean, for you men, it, it doesn't do as much for, for me aside from hydration and kidneys, but for you men, it's really important for bonding to your families, to your wife, to your children, and to anyone that you're meant to take care of. So I, I, I have to think it's got to be a bit related to all of the, the broken communities that we're seeing. I, I think that it plays a huge role, uh, underappreciated role. I totally agree with you. Uh, let's, let's go back to dairy. Yeah. Anywhere from two thirds to 75 percent of the population of the entire world is lactose intolerant, mm -hmm. meaning that at about the age of five, six, seven years of age, they lose the ability to break down lactose. They, they become mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't have lactase persistence, uh, lactase being the enzyme that breaks down lactose. And there have been four or five instances in evolutionary uh, anthropology where humans independently in, on different continents have developed lactase persistence. And now they're able to actually ingest uh, dairy as an adult and not have all the problems from that. What's been your experience with the hunter gatherers you visited and the use of dairy for adults and how do they prepare that dairy? How is it processed? Uh, great question. So some cultures I go to almost uh, rely on it about 90% of their calories in their diet and they're in perfect health, right? And many of these cultures are in regions where they don't technically have the gene to break down uh, right. lactose at all, but they ferment it. I don't go anywhere where someone just drinks the, yeah, the milk without fermentation. So I think that's a big piece that's really been missing. We don't ferment milk properly now. And we also use really not great breeds of cows and, and animals. So it can cause a lot of people a problem to where they think they can't consume dairy. But what I see uh, in the, it's really more the agrarian and the herding cultures, mostly the herding. They they do so much dairy, uh, <laughs> enormous amounts and really creative things that, that make it so delicious. But uh, but they all, they do fermentation. They make it into an alcohol. They make it into cheese cookies. They taste like cookies. They're amazing. And these things that taste like donuts, it's 100% cheese. Wow. If I could get a cook to make me those, amazing. <laughs> they often will have a whole yurt or tent that is designed just for making dairy. So they actually build a whole structure, each family for the fermentation of the dairy. And, and that's really quite common across these cultures. Now the hunter gatherers, they don't do milk by, by definition because they're not, uh, they're not hurting animals, but, uh, but what I've noticed, and, and this is just an observation. So take it with a grain of salt, but what I've noticed is that most of the hunter gatherer communities that I go to if I go to communities that are fully traditional, they're amazing health. If I mm -hmm. go to communities that have modernized at all, their health uh, dwindles much faster within one to two generations as opposed to say three to seven. Uh, so the dairy seems to be quite protective uh, of the modern foods. And I, I think part of that is from the extreme levels of ADK which we really aren't getting in our diet today, right? Everyone's going and taking supplements and this is really a superfood if it's done right. And, um, and yeah, so it, I, I really think it's under that and also the probiotics that you're getting from it as, as well. This, uh, this bacteria phobia that we've had has caused quite a bit of problems. I totally agree. And I have a lot of friends who are huge proponents of raw milk. And I think that if, if raw milk is properly sourced and properly handled, I think it's fine. Uh, I think it's the least bad of all the dairies for an adult to drink. Uh, but when you, you, when you use technology like microbes to ferment the dairy, I think that it remo removes the majority of the problems with an adult ingesting dairy. And so at every, in every herding tribe you've seen, you, you haven't really seen the adults just drinking milk by the glass. They they tend to process it with microbes first to ferment it, That's break right. down. Yeah, yeah, it's so almost always fermented. Before. Yeah, and so like when I was in Mongolia, they do a lot of horse milk, and they ferment that into a mild alcohol, kind of like our kombucha. Uh, and 
Uh, and with that one, you can really, I mean, it, it's really quite fermented when you taste it, it's sour. So most think, most people like sour. We, we kind of aren't a sour culture in America, but most cultures are. And so they go towards that. It really, the only exception of when I've seen someone drink fresh milk is when it's, uh, you know, they're doing something else to the cow. Like they're collecting some blood to drink or, you know, uh, they're collecting the milk to bring and then ferment in, in the tent or in the house. And so they're just like having a cup on the go, but it's it's not common. It's it's really more of like a maybe us picking up a treat once every two weeks. Like it's just not common. So I, I do know many people have healed on the all milk diet and on the high milk diet. And I say, whatever works, go for it. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and there may be a lot of ancestral basis for that because most of these cultures have a way to use the food if something does happen to the person's health. And so as some of them will go very high in organs, some of them will go just to soups, some of them will do fasting, some will do milk. So a lot of these uh, higher dairy cultures throughout Asia will really start using a lot of milk. Fascinating. Blood. Mm -hmm. Let's talk yeah. about blood because I know mm -hmm. there are several cultures you visited that ingest a mm -hmm. lot of blood. And, and to the average American, that the gross meter is off the chart. Like, what are you even talking about? Nobody eats blood. And so blood, in my opinion, is the most nutrient-dense superfood multivitamin on the planet. But it's mm -hmm. gross. And in fact, some of the major religions have a you know an ordinance. No, do not ingest blood. Uh, what's been your experience with that? And what do you think about ingesting blood? Well, I just want to say I am on so on page with you. I, I think it's the most powerful of all the organs to consume. It, and yeah, so what I totally yes. <laughs> yes. And I, I think it's the biggest one that's missing. Uh when you have it, so whenever I'm with these the groups that drink it fresh, I get excited to go. And I, I am a girl from Ohio, you know, what? so <laughs> not grew up on organ meat. I never had meat that had a bone in it until I was in my 20s. So I didn't grow up eating exotic foods. I ate very kind of proper food, right? On a plate, there's your, there's your cut of meat and here's your vegetable, the way that it, we started in the 50s. So it was always a little difficult for me when I first started, but not anymore, because when I have a cup of milk, or uh, sorry, of blood, I feel superhuman. I don't know what it is, but if we could bottle that, I would be so in. So, so many of the cultures will be high blood cultures. So many of the cultures that we consider carnivore uh, really aren't doing high meat or high protein. They have meat and protein, but they're really higher in blood and dairy. And that's really their primary. Uh, they don't do chicken. I, haven't come, I don't think I've come across any carnivore communities that do chicken. It's not to say that chicken is problematic. There's usually myths that go along with these things. So, um, you know, other cultures eat chicken just fine. But in the carnivore communities, they tend to not do it. It tends to be dairy and a red meat or fish um, or red meat and fish. Like when I'm in uh, with the Inuits, it's a lot of whale, uh, a lot of whale and bird. So, uh, so then other cultures do blood sausage. Uh, that's very common throughout most of Europe and honestly, most of the world. And then, and it, I, I mean, if you go down the street in any European country, they're not going to think anything of blood sausage, right? right? That's just like oatmeal to them. <laughs> it's just like so normal. And then, uh, and then a number of cultures like here, they do the blood pancakes and others will process it. And in fact, so in the indigenous communities, the, the three worst enemies that I've seen, and, it, and it's been horrifically sad, uh, what I've seen and, and shocking. It's been the church, the government, and the schools. Fourth, nonprofits do incredible harm, and unintentionally. Unintent it's well-meaning mm -hmm. people. But the, the church has really changed the diet a lot. So here with the Sami, their primary food is reindeer. Uh, and th and they really need it. And everything is made out of reindeer. Um, I have whole reindeer outfits and they're amazing. Pants, hats, everything. It keeps you warm and the food is sure. very good for you. You have a lot of reindeer soup. Well, they have a law in Sweden. I don't know if it's here in Norway, I'll look. But in Sweden, there's a law that the Sami are no longer allowed to kill reindeer in their traditional way. So they have to use a stun gun. Now, when you use a stun gun, you lose all the organs of the head and you lose the blood. 
So you can't right. have the blood. And so they lose most of their traditional foods. They, they're a big blood culture. And, uh, and so many of the traditional cultures have lost the ability to have what they normally would um, based on laws and things like that. So so yeah, blood is a, a major one. In Mongolia, for a long time, I was starting to think that they didn't do the blood until uh, I, until they did some slaughters. And oh, oh, they do. They drink it just like the Maasai. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yes, but it's it's a big food, and I think it would be one of the biggest ones. Like if someone was sick, I know there's a lot of focus with liver, but for me, the the things that I see the most improvement with are blood and thymus. Thymus gland is amazing. Uh, maybe followed by kidney if there's histamine issues, but it's very indiv individual. I love it. I love it. Mary, as, as we wrap up, I, I try to always make nutrition simple. So let's imagine there's somebody who's tuned in and watching this, and they've been thoroughly grossed out by this entire conversation. I know. I'm sorry. But they're, they're currently eating a standard Western diet, and they feel like crap. They've got, they're got obese. they got type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, skin issues, gut issues, joint issues. Yeah. Walk this person through step one, two, three. What 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 are the beginning changes they should make in their diet as they start to eliminate some things, add other things? How would you just walk this person through the first few steps of adopting a proper human diet? I think really our proper human diet is based on where we are right now and what the traditional foods were for that region. But that would take research. So to keep it simple. You want to go to the foods that don't have all the toxins and the inflammatory agents. And we, we have a mismatch publicly about what's inflammatory. So I'll, I'll go through that quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Exactly upside down and backwards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, just turn it upside down. And so what I would do is eat less. We have a tendency in America to want to buy and get more and get things, uh, add in superfoods, which none of the superfoods are superfoods. So I would reverse it and I would just go down to like steak or shrimp, or find your protein and eat that. And then if you do dairy, great, change your fat to an animal fat. If you just do that, you'll be a lot better. And then you can start looking at vegetables and fruits, but really the more simple you go, the better. Even, uh, you know, when I travel, I primarily eat like meats because you can get it anywhere. And a lot of people assume that I must eat terribly when I travel. It's actually very easy because you see, you just don't pick as many things. <laughs> you just eat less, uh, less uh, variety. And the cultures I go to, they don't have variety. It's, there's no supermarkets like we have. So simple, repeat. Uh, and then when you feel comfortable, then you can look into another food. That's what I would say. I love it. I love it. That's yeah. great advice to get started. Mary, thank you so much for doing thank this. You. Where can people find you if, if they were fascinated by this, con this conversation and want to learn more? <laughs> Oh, thank you. So I have a dysautonomia program. It's what I was sick with. And that's at enableyourhealing.com in a practitioner training. Everything else can be found on maryreddick.com. We're doing updates, so it might be dead right now. It'll be up in a day or two if it is. And of course, Instagram for Mary Reddick or, uh, or YouTube too, under my name. So very easy to find me. I love it. And I need you to get on Twitter more often and help me fight uh, the vegans and the plant-based people, please. That's just my. I'm never idea. on Twitter. I will no, come to you later. That, please. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. Yeah. Have a great time and and post lots of pictures. And if you if you drive the dog sled again, we need some video. I, it probably is difficult to have your phone while you're driving a dog oh, sled. I did. Get some. Oh, you did. Okay, I'm gonna. Yeah, go I have a wearable camera. camera. It's amazing. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I love thanks. it. Thank you so much, Mary.